Stevens Point Historic Preservation Design Review Commission meeting, recorded April 6, 2022. Alright, it looks like we got 4 o'clock, so we will get started. We'll call the April 6, 2022 meeting of the Historic Preservation Design Review Commission to order. Uh, in the absence of Chair Siebert, I'll begin with a roll call. Uh, Siebert is excused, McComb is excused, and Christensen is absent. Scripps? Here. Uh, Malevsky? Here. And Monk? Here. Uh, three zero. we got a quorum, and both of you will have voting capabilities. Uh, before we get to agenda item number two, since we are uh, absent a chair, I'd like to take a motion from one of you three to appoint someone as temporary chair for the remainder of the meeting. I would prefer not, so <laughs> okay. somebody else can. Sarah. Sarah, Peter. <laughs> Go for it, Peter. All I right. nominate Peter to be temporary chair. Okay. I second. Second. And all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, three zero, three zero, and Commissioner Monk, it, this is your meeting. No pressure. All right, <laughs> uh, first time for everything, I guess. So. Yeah, we'll just uh, read out the agenda item. Okay. Three. What's that? Uh, just read the third agenda item and then you can get back to me. Number three. So a request from Greg, uh, sorry about this, Goki, uh, representing Opera House LLC for a facade improvement grant in the amount of $114,473.98 to perform exterior, exterior improvements to the building located at 1124 Main Street. All right, I will actually kick it over to uh, Mr. Goki or anybody else from Opera House in attendance to give a little background as to the project, just a refresher, and then specifically the facade grant request. Sure. Um, Wildcard was selected uh, as the uh, company to move forward with the redevelopment of the Fox Theater. Uh, we are returning it to the original Opera House as it was originally incorporated in 1893. Four. So close, I never get that right. Uh, in 1894, um, this is the only public money um, we had said we would ask for uh, throughout the project. Um, we've already completed the majority of the demo work on the building. Uh, there's a little bit left on the inside we're finishing up right now. Uh, we're finishing our state uh, plans to move forward with the interior remodel. But obviously the important piece of this is the maintenance and restoration of the facade. Uh, and that's really, Today's big focus is taking it back to what you see on uh, the packets there. Um, the money that we're asking for is to replace all the glass on the building, put in new doors, new woodwork, fix the tin, paint the building, fix the brickwork, which obviously is that you know, really striking part of it. And then the big part is waterproofing the building. And it's a huge part of the project is making sure that we get water away from the brick so that this is something that's sitting here 100 years from now uh, and still looks just as amazing as it will be when we get done with it. Um, it's really the, the big piece of it is making sure we take care of this as we tuck point the building, fix the roof, and maintain that historic structure. Awesome. And one thing I would just note as well, it was mentioned in the agenda packet that the design review for this project already took place back in I believe October of 2020. Um, so this is just an extension of the request, same project, but uh, subset of a, a specific request. So um, that before we start discussion, we would need a motion in a second. Mo motion to um, approve or deny the uh, request. In so so um, a motion to approve or deny the request to the amount of $114,000 and $473 cents and 473 dollars and 98 cents. So moved. Second. Yeah, second. Second. Okay. All right, and then discussion. Um, move to discussion. 
I have a question regarding the amount. So I remember the previous iteration of facade improvement grants were uh, capped at thirty thousand dollars for most projects. Is that changed in this <coughs> new insertion of funds? And can you, if there's a discussion of kind of this amount vis-a-vis -vis other projects? Yeah. So the thirty thousand dollar cap relates uh, to whether or not our common council would have to approve of it as well. It okay. would be under. Um, this commission would be the sole entity who would review and approve. Census request is over, um, then that's something that would require council approval as well. And I don't know if the director wanted to mention about sure. the dollar yeah. amount. Yeah, um, so we do typically uh, budget about $100,000 a year for facade improvement grants. Uh, when the development agreement was put together uh, with Wildcard for uh, the, the Opera House um, redevelopment project, we did have a clause that stated the city would work with them on uh, extending beyond that 30,000 for the fa facade improvement. Um, as this commission, Sarah, I don't know if you were here when the uh, 1155 building, 1055 building? I do remember that, remember? Yeah. And so that was, that was um, I believe about $140,000 and requested for facade improvement. So essentially what would happen is uh, because it's beyond the, the 30,000 that this body has that control over, um, you would essentially make a recommendation to the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee would review the materials, which they'll do uh, next week, and they'll kick it then to Common Council who of the ultimate authority over the 100 and about 15,000 that's being requested uh, this afternoon. So uh, we were aware of it. Uh, we do have a number of other uh, facade improvement projects that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, we had transferred the facade improvement dollars. Um, it used to be in a separate fund that was for specifically facade improvements. We actually removed it and put it in TIF number six uh, two years ago. And so that gives us the ability to replenish that dollar amount out of the TIF district with the excess increment within TIF six, uh, and sometimes TIF district number five, which has helped uh, balance the, the books in TIF six historically as well. So um, from a financial perspective, uh, we are able to handle the request um, and then we will actually have the additional requests that we'll also be able to handle as they come through the next several months. So, good question. Great, thank you. I just had a couple questions and, and it's basically um, not necessarily about the grant but about your work that the grant would be covering. So, and just this is a little off, but um, did you find when you took when you did the demolition inside? Did you find anything that was significant that you could retain? So we're going to reutilize a lot of materials. Uh, Aaron Batchelor's actually been posting quite a few of these smaller knickknacks, things like that we found throughout the building, uh, and I know the intention is to display some of that. Aaron, do you want to come up and talk about that for a moment? Um, one of the other things I can touch on though is. We're actually trying to save like lumber, things like that as we dis demolish to try and reutilize as we re redo in the building. Mm -hmm. um, anything we can, uh, we do have the Fox sign that was on the front. Um, no one had stepped forward that was able to take it, so we are gonna try and reutilize it in the building. But Aaron can talk about some of the things we found inside and what we're gonna do. Hello, uh, my name is Aaron Batzler. I'm the corporate brand representative for Wildcard Corp and the Opera House LLC uh, interim brand representative for them. Our design is going to uh, be like a testament to the original kind of layout of the theater. So the entryway as well as the staircase is going to be maintained in the same original position on the interior. The ballroom is going to be brought back to its original grandeur. The floors have been retained in the ballroom um, in the general layout. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the interior finishings have been removed because they're just in such poor shape from damp and uh, moisture exposure over clearly many decades from when we had gone in there and had acquired the building. Um, that was what we had determined. So a lot of those finishes have been removed, but the general layout, the walls, the interior layout is going to be retained. And then we're actually also going to be the area where the auditorium used to exist that patio area is going to be a testament to the interior layout of the original auditorium. So on the, uh, in the example of the north facade, I believe it is, the north facade would be the rear of the building. Um, that example there does not show it, uh, just so you can see the window layout. Right. 
but there will also be uh, an exterior uh, mezzanine balcony that will be existing in the area where the original uh, the original uh, um, balcony. Balcony, balcony, the original interior balcony seating was. Um, that's going to be there, and then we're also talking about doing a design in the concrete of the patio area that will be a medallion, like was on the ceiling of the original auditorium ceiling. So we're trying to um, do our best to pay homage, homage to the history of the building and its original features that weren't able to be saved. Um, I had another question. It looked like in the picture that originally, well, up until recently, there were stores on each side of the building. Correct. So it doesn't look like there's any doors to those those areas. Are you going to incorporate those two stores into the, your space on the inside? Is that what's going to happen? Correct. So originally, if you look at the south rendering, uh, the rendering of the south facade, um, what you see on either side of those two sets of center doors, those were also doors from these images that we've been able to source. They were also doors. However, um, to kind of um, help with cost, doors are very expensive and difficult to maintain as well as they affect um, HVAC, air circulation, heating and cooling. So we decided to not include those on the sides because of the space requirements. Um, the original doors were the skinnier version. Um, not what you would say ADA nowadays. Right. So we decided not to include those doors on the very ends. However, we were able to fit two sets of ADA doors in the center and then those immediately on the interior when you would walk in to either side would be access to the retail spaces. Oh, okay. So those the access will be on the interior instead of the exterior. And as we're changing the use case for the building, uh, one side will end up being a event space and the other side will end up being a bar with a small kitchen behind it to serve the event space on the second floor as well. So, so those won't be necessarily open to the public. They, they will, will in that sense. They will. They, they will. They will. They will, mm -hmm. they will simply, um, because the original design um, kept those units separate from the main floor, and we did lose all that auditorium space in the demolition, um, we're basically going to be uh, opening up spaces, doorways into the side so that we can utilize the space as an entire space instead of separate spaces. Um, I guess my real concern is obviously you're going to be restoring the brick and I, um, that back wall, it was obviously interior brick. Correct. So, and I don't know, and I don't know whether you've checked that with a historical society, maybe in Madison or something, whether or not that was a different brick because it was an interior space, because I know that can be really vulnerable, and certainly the kind of mortar you put you put in in between those bricks when you do that that tuck pointing is really crucial. Because I also know that there was really crummy brick made around here, <laughs> and I know that on that well, it used to be the Krems building, the building where downtown on the square, that southwest corner. Um, on one of the tuck pointing jobs, they put the wrong kind of mortar in, and what happened was then the brick deteriorated. So I guess I do have a concern about that, particularly with that back area. Obviously, the front has been out forever, and one would hope that, that the mortar that you're putting in is the appropriate kind. Um, and I know you, you know, particularly that back wall, I don't know as far as keeping the water out of there, you know, what, what it means with that kind of brick because it was interior. If I could just interject real quick. Sure. Um, I know that was one of the conditions that was placed on okay. the design review request from October 2020. Right. Is, okay. And, uh, and I know that was, right. yeah, no, no worries. And okay. I know that was uh, one of the comments that was addressed by right. uh, one of the commissioners at the time. Okay. And I would like to add, we, we made sure the bids were getting in. These masons have already inspected the building. Okay. They're going to, because we have the exact same concerns, ensuring that, like I said, that 100 years from now, this building still right, amazing. Right, standing. right, right. They, they are aware when we walk, did the walkthroughs with them and initially, you know, initiated conversation about that, they're aware of the historic nature of the building right. and its unique needs, therefore, so. I just want. I just think that this project is fantastic. I think right. that it's a great example of adaptive reuse, and 
a building that has a lot of community eyes and investment and in seeing it continue to serve the community and it's serving it in a similar spirit to what it used to do. So I just, I really, I appreciate the direction that this project's headed. So thank you for all the hard work you've put into thinking about the historic character of it. Thank you. We hope thank that you. it's going to be a, a point of pride uh, for the community once it's complete. It certainly would have been a big hole on Main Street. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Which would have been tough to fill. There will definitely be, um, it will be a very unique space. It will fill potentially a knee gap in the, in the downtown area and will really, I think, uh, make, the, make the downtown more vibrant. Thank you for your support. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? No. Other, all those in favor say aye. 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 Don't we have to? Uh, motion and a second was yes. already made. Oh, okay. Uh, motion right. by Scripps and a right. second by. Okay. All right. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Motion carries. Did we have to approve the minutes? Uh, right. That did. would be the second item, yeah. Okay. So we can do that otherwise. Okay. So, um, report of the March 2nd, um, 2022 meeting of the Historic Preservation Design Review Commission. Motion, um, second. I'll, I'll, Mo make, I'll make a motion that we approve. Yep. I'll second. And those approved say aye. 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 Um, <laughs> opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, item number four, discussion only. A request from Mike Beacom uh, for a conceptual plan review to perform exterior improvements to the property located, located at 1052 Main Street. All right, and we actually have uh, Mr. Beacom on the call right now, so, uh, you know, there's... Uh, for certain projects over the last few years, applicants wish to provide just a conceptual plan for the commission, more so just to gather initial feedback so uh, the property owner or the applicant can uh, proceed forward with building design uh, bids if they're requesting a facade grant before bringing their full-fledged plan submittal before the commission. So uh, with that, Mr. Beacom, I will transfer it over to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Adam. Um, so 1052 Main Street, built late 70s, um, mid-century modern. Um, and so a couple of things we're looking at is potential items, work project for this summer and fall, um, doing roof, uh, updating AC, one of our AC units, I believe is close to original. Um, but also the exterior is to a point where it's tough to patch and color wise it's baiting uh, the the architect for this job is mike metcalf mike is still around i had a chance to have coffee with him a couple times um, and so we've talked about he, he is very partial to this type of facade um, the public may disagree but we've talked to him uh, from time to time and, and uh, he suggested he might help me with some color schemes that would meet the historic preservation uh, specs uh, but also that too would be similar to the presentation you just had, looking at, uh, at after this age, something that also would be a water deterrent, uh, kind of a two for one with a, with a paint. Um, the other exterior to discuss for this, one of the challenges since we, we've had this building for about a decade now uh, with Artisan Alley, as it's been uh, now recognized, is signage. I can't tell you how many people walk past her and go, oh, I, I didn't even know that that was down there. Um, and because that's now been converted mostly to its original use, which was retail, um, for many years it had, it had gone into office, but when this was originally designed, um, it was retail, obviously signage is a big thing. And so we have a number of sandwich boards, but I don't think that that's ideal. We're looking at putting signage back to that uh, the wall that's adjoining Lear's shop, um, that did have signage for many years that has come down. So we would be adding some signage back to that. Um, and then through the alley, 
um, some, I don't want to say protruding sides. Uh, there's a visual there that you can see, maybe some signs that hang from those horizontal uh, bars that run with the lighting scheme uh, um, that would offer something directional that people would see for, for the shops and services that are down artisan alley. Um, with the potential too of adding some, some lighting just to bring special attention. And then the last thing I, I think I've listed, which I've always thought would be a nice pet project, but when Metcalf designed this building, he put um, planters on the north and south wall of the building. Um, you know, I, I think uh, Ms. Malepsky may know this. Some people know this building as the Ross Bar building. I've always referred to as downtown plaza, but Ross Bar is a combination of Dave Roman and a bunch of people's names. Um, and they never installed those planters and the, the owner between us, because it's a three owner building, they never did either. Um, I think it'd be a cool feature. And so one of the, the things that we're going to do is to make sure that the drainage that comes off the north and south wall works properly. I had talked to Adam and Tori Jennings when she was still the district one alder. I've since talked to, to Mark uh, what that would mean. Um, you know, I think the biggest request is, is finding somebody that's an expert that would say this is what you would plant. Uh, we're looking for something that would create just some greenery um, to, to add to the downtown, but also something that's probably you know, low maintenance, maybe a few times a year, um, and, and the right types of, of vegetation for those for the north and south wall. Um, so that's that's conceptually that's where it's at. There's some rough numbers in there. We do have some bids, but not it's not fully cooked. I'm interested in feedback, um, and um, yeah, it's uh, I kind of open it up to this group if you have ideas or thoughts or questions. One thing I can start just to initiate the conversation is landscaping in general, from a design review aspect, can be. I wouldn't say tricky, but more tedious in nature and that making sure whatever type of landscaping, if it's planters and specifically the type of species that are uh, proposed, that they don't detract from, you know, in this case, the storefront. So I guess, are there any general thoughts as to if I openness? If I know the, because I didn't stop downtown and actually look at what 1052 was, but there is an overhang there, right? Believe, but uh, Mr. Beacom? There is overhang an overhang in the meaning. front, right? Yeah. So, yeah, for that front edge, you, you kind of, the planters do go over the entrance. But are you talking like an awning? Right. I, no, I'm just saying, where, where, where were those planters going to be put? Are they on the ground floor or what? Are no, they they're the built sidewalk? into the facade on they're, the second level. Yeah. Oh, on the second level. Okay. All right. Yeah, you couldn't see them from street, uh, from street view, but you can see where the drainages come out of each side. And there is, there is a rendering that would have been used as a presentation when this building was submitted to council in 78, where you can kind of see that greenery flowing over. That's where it is. So there is historical precedent for having planters located in the general location where you're requesting. Yeah, yeah that's, it's what it was designed for. Why nobody's done it in 40 plus years. Probably nobody wanted to manage it. Um, I'm guessing. Um, I just see it as an accent. It's a, a missed opportunity. I think that the ideas sound really exciting and I, I think for me it's hard to picture exactly all of these ideas without having some sort of rendering in front of me and so yeah I, I look forward to seeing how that develops as I mean you're all in conversation I'm assuming already so yeah that'll be something that you know since this is initial feedback uh, Mike will provide some initial drawings you know once we reach the point where staff is comfortable with it then that'll be the time when we'll bring it before you all um, you know I'll be looking at more low-rise type of planting that would be preferable or I guess, is there any Are there other plantings in downtown like this? I can't, are there? No, except maybe in that little plaza. No, there isn't. There, and, and that's one of the issues because there, there are circles that are in front of the um, 
I think there's some in front of the bank, but I think there's also some that are in front of the law office. And one of the problems is that those buildings, particularly on the south side of the, of the street, face north. And those plants don't get any light at all. And if you notice, it ends up being an empty planter. And there were, in front of the BMO Bank, you know, and I was talking about the Associated, they had trees on the street, and those, those trees in the, on the sidewalk, they died. And I'm not sure if those two were not, they needed more light because the building completely shaded them probably a good portion of the day, except maybe midsummer and, you know, maybe July through August or something. But um, in front of the BMO Bank, there used to be plantings there you know, all the way around and they kind of filled it in. There used to be a, they got that bump out because they had a fountain, you know, and now it's just kind of a bump out. And so I think that one of the problems with plantings, if you don't have, particularly if they're the second story, if you don't have windows that somebody's gonna open and water those plants, you know, unless they have some kind of irrigation system to them, obviously the stuff is gonna drip out of the bottom, but you know, it would be really nice to have some greenery, but maybe that's more a function of the city putting planters on the sidewalk or something. Because I know certainly downtown, a lot of the places where there were plantings, they weren't continually successful. I just wonder if our commission needs to be in the business of like what plantings go in a planter box. <laughs> Do you right, know? Because it's right. ephemeral. It's not something right. that, unless it affects yeah. the integrity of the building. It seems exactly. like it's not really our no. purview. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Uh, so, Adam, could you pull up the street view of 1052 sure. Main? Because I, I think that this this will provide a really nice right. visual for the commission. Um, and one thing, you know, my experience with, with this uh, body it has been, uh, we've been always pretty, um, we've given a lot of preferential treatment to historic brick facade. Um, obviously the 1052 building and, and that mid-century uh, 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 light, and that's really, I mean, it is historic preservation now that mid-century is, uh, is, you know, more than 60, 70 years old. So uh, here's the downtown plaza. Really, I think the purview of, of this body is there is a change to the physical facade. That area um, here is where the planters would go. Okay. Okay, and these little dots here, those are actually the drainage tubes um, for the planters. So if it rains or when they get watered, you know, water goes down and, and out onto the, onto the sidewalk. So I think that the real question is, is there an interest from this commission to um, allow the property owner to install those planters. Um, I don't necessarily think like dictating what kind of uh, plantings you have is necessarily appropriate uh, for this body. In fact, most of our, even like our planning commission rarely gets into the nuances of what kind of landscaping is or is not required. Um, you know, just from my perspective, uh, I'm a huge fan of the mid-century uh, uh, modern era, um, but the the adding of the planting is, is actually a nice tip of the hat to, to that specific style of architecture where you've got that more brutalist architecture mixed in with that more natural uh, flair of having the planters itself. Uh, we do have, and you can kind of see it on the street view here, the city does maintain uh, boulevard planters essentially. Um, and this photo is a few years old, but those are actually painted every year as part of the um, trash canvas project. Um, and our parks department does maintain and water those on a regular basis. Because this is on a private property, uh, it would be up to Mr. Beacom to, to maintain and plant on a yearly basis, so. Unless the city wants to maintain. No, thanks. <laughs> We're good. I guess that I wouldn't want to see that planter filled with artificial flowers at some point. Yeah, I think that's fair. Art artificial plants. And then uh, the other thing that Mr. Beacom was talking about was the signage. Um, uh, Adam, if you could zoom in on the Lee areas where that signage would be. So actually, historically, uh, there used to be a number of smaller signs uh, that were kind of You're right. stacked here. Yep. Um, and, and so those were removed at some point, uh, and, and Mr. Beacom is asking for those to be installed again. Uh, we do have, it is considered Artisan Alley. It was a city uh, placemaking project that took place probably five years ago. 
Um, obviously, we've done some murals in there. Uh, but there are a number of businesses that exist down Artisan Alley, and I think having some type of presence on Main Street it would encourage more pedestrian traffic through that alleyway to access those businesses. So, like, um, the f would it potentially replace the need for like the sandwich, like boards on the sidewalk? Yeah, to a certain extent. Um, okay. I, you know, I I think downtowns are kind of unique in and of itself because you have such an eclectic signage program. You know, you have some sandwich boards, you have some wall signs, you have some hanging signs. Um, and, and I think that just adds to kind of the character and charm of a downtown. Yeah. You know, I used to work uh, in Door County and we hated sandwich boards for some <laughs> reason, like everyone thought it was cluttered. Uh, but I, I think it adds some unique characteristics and we don't go out of our way to over-regulate that kind of signage because mm -hmm. uh, it is temporary, it does come in at night. Yeah. And if it doesn't, a college student walks off with it, right? So <laughs> uh, something to think about as well. Yeah, I like that and I also like the uh, um, adding greenery to the downtown. Yeah, I don't see any, I mean, based on kind of preliminary thoughts here, it, it's, I, I like the idea of adding signage to give those small shops a little bit more visibility and planners seem like a great way to add that dimensionality we were talking about with that brutalist architecture so yeah it was there from what I remember previously there was green greenery there right like initially or where the so. signs are being proposed no or? the they were the uh, where, where the the planters um, there's some street planters where, where, where are the planters? There used to be? Well, there's just some street planters oh, Okay. the city okay. maintains. Right, okay. Yeah, the one right over. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Any other no. comments? Uh, Mike, do you have any comments or questions um, expanding beyond what you we've talked about so far? No, I think the hope would be to uh, bring back something um, uh, with a rendering and probably a formal ask, uh, maybe with your next meeting. Um, and I don't see us looking for a 40% match on this. We're, we're probably gonna have a bigger investment, but um, most of this is non rent producing and, and it's beautification. So really just looking for feedback at this point. And if anybody wants to see <clears throat> kind of the planters, you can see them from interior view. Uh, I'd be happy to accommodate that. And Maybe one thing I'll add to is, you know, since the installation of these planters would have to be brought before this commission for their approval, you know, if it's of interest, we could always schedule like a walking tour and visit the site right before right. whenever the meeting's held. Kind of what we did uh, over the last few years for certain projects. Right. So. I, I guess as we were, I was just listening to that program today, you know, regarding historic preservation. Um, Obviously, there is that element that is a surprise with um, greenery on the building, but you also don't want it to look like it's pastiche. You know, it's it's something added on to the building because it is clean right now, and sometimes you could put something on the building that looks like it's just pasted on. Even though the architect said that, but that, you know. Are there preferences as to the material type of the planters, I haven't color? Thought of, I haven't thought of that. I'm just or thinking open. of. open. Yeah. I'm well, obviously mention, like, matching the, the time period and the design of the original building, I think, right? right? What kind of, whatever kind of materials and right. masonry would have been used back then. And I don't know what was on his plans. What was on Mike Metcalf's plan? What did he plan on doing for the box? Yeah, and that's something that you know, if Mike is able to, we can uh, uh, share it and we can include that in the packet when you're ready to bring this before the commission. Yeah, I don't know if you could see it, but actually, the second story windows kind of pitch inward. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike uh, Beacom, if I'm not mistaken, the planter would be underneath those windows, so it wouldn't. Right necessarily right. protrude from the building, uh, the front of the building, but uh, would probably just sit right on top. And then, as Mike mentioned, there are the 
the drains that already exist. So I, I don't think you're going to see a lot of uh, protrusion from the front of the building as part of it. But I think definitely giving some guidance to say, you know, if you're going to be adding planters, uh, be certain to match the color and texture of the exterior. Um, you know, that, that stucco, rock stucco uh, uh, of that time period, I, I think is appropriate. Uh, what you don't want is, you know, red brick that looks like the Fox Theater, <laughs> you know, <laughs> lining that uh, as an example. But awesome. Any other no. comments or questions? Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, all. I'll just say. So we are adjourned at 4.35. All right. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.